Good evening, everyone. Good to see you here tonight. So we'll start with about a half hour meditation. So you can get yourselves comfortable. I don't know about you, but these days it feels like my system really keeps asking for more rest, some unwinding. With all that we're taking in and making sense of. It feels like that's a really good medicine to offer this heart, mind, body. So perhaps we can begin with another invitation to let go. Not a demand or even an expectation. But just a reminder that it might be possible. I don't know, let's see. Just feeling into what it's like to have a body. A body that senses Reconnecting with that reality, this body that senses. The head that senses. The neck, and the shoulders. The arms. hands and the fingers. The chest, the organs, the ribs, the back.
the trunk. Genitals, the buttocks, The legs and the feet. Studying the awareness with the body, just like this. And recognizing the breath as an expression of body. What's that like when the attention meets the breath? Attention that is directed to the breath. An awareness that receives breath. Inviting the breath to nourish the entire body. Feeling the expansion that comes with receiving the breath or the pressure or the lightness or the heaviness. or the movement. Or the warmth.
a breath that is always changing. Each moment, a new moment to explore breath. It's hard to even call it breath because it's so much more than this concept. Tuning in to our relationship to the breath. So that we have some sense of how to practice this regular this regular letting go not holding on to the breath, not even trying too hard to be with the breath, accepting the degree to which it's possible, the degree to which the breath can be known, not looking for anything in particular, Just continuing to apply that very gentle, persistent presence. This is what we might call effort. And when we're a bit off balance, we'll know it because we'll feel it. We'll make an adjustment. We'll continue in silence now.
And opening your eyes now, coming back into the room with everyone else. Thanks for your practice. Well, this is when I like to ask us all to look around at each other and just uh, appreciate being in the room together, seeing each other's faces and names. I'm looking right at my brother, Femi. Hey, Fem. <laughs> oh, Femi is a teacher at Common Ground and now a doctor in California. So we miss you, Femi. I miss you guys so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for dropping in. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, having me. I'm wondering if anybody's here for the first time. If you are, just unmute yourself and say hello. Veterans. Everybody's a veteran. <laughs> We've been here at least once. Awesome. Oh, good. So, hope you enjoyed, um, for those of you who are here last week, hope you enjoyed hearing Mark Numberg talk about the jhanas. He was covering for me while I was away Zooming with my teacher training cohort. So grateful, yeah, that we can do that for each other. And I've been working through, teaching through a, a wonderful book called Listening to the Heart, um, a contemplative journey to engaged practice. And it's a book by Tanisara and Kitasaro. So available online if you'd like to pick it up, but of course you don't have to. And so on chapter four, we've been exploring this practice of the teachings of samadhi or you know, different ways to talk about samadhi, but steadying the heart, steadying the mind. And I don't know uh, about you, but really, I feel uh, really challenged by this material, this practice in such good ways. Like I was thinking earlier today that I've read lots of Dharma books and I don't know if it's the intention behind the practice for me, but really stepping into what it means to steady the mind in right in the middle of our daily lives with the world the way that it is feels like uh, a, a real deep exploration. And I hope it's been that way for you too. So I wanted to read a little bit from the end of the chapter, start at the back and move forward tonight. This chapter four is written by Kitty Saro and he says, the training of samadhi is not easy. The Buddha said it is easier to conquer 10,000 warriors on a battlefield than it is to truly train the mind. So why do we do it? Well, when we don't, we make all kinds of assumptions that lead to conflict and endless suffering. Like that of a snake, this poison will slowly undermine our well-being. On a more global scale, the unchecked poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion have driven us to a collective precipice. Our future looks increasingly precarious, so there's a real urgency to see our lives, both individual and collectively, through a clear lens. When the mind is composed, it sees clearly. And so this is, it brings us to the heart of 
what we're doing here with this exploration, really learning how it's relevant in our lives and our engagement and how we make sense of and participate in the world as it is with all the challenges with climate disruption and, and all of its manifestations with intense racism and all of its manifestations with our own individual challenges and emotional come aparts <laughs> because you know it's true we have those right yeah we do with all the uncertainty of coronavirus right and on and on and on so it's learning how to really train this heart to be totally here not needing to turn away but learning to use all the skills and strategies available to us to learn how to meet and relate really wisely. So there are many ways to describe this process of steadying the heart or this teaching on samadhi. And Kitty Sorrow likes to talk about samadhi as the compo composure, right? The composed mind, just like he did in the last chapter. And Philip Moffat likes to describe samadhi as a deep connection with humanity. And there's so many other ways to describe what really as a process of getting close to the truth of understanding, of being able to be here to, you know, swim in it, to land in it. And in some ways, words are always going to fall short. And so I was wondering again, like, okay, how is it that I'm relating to samadhi just as I'm practicing with this over the week in many moments? And I keep coming back to this deep, deep connection. Like the, this, the process or the inquiry is really a deepening connection with life and all of its processes, all of its forces. It in includes fierce truth telling and heartbreak and compassion, real intimacy. The deepest connection with life and all of the flow of life from birth to death, right? And all of the ways that this heart relates to life. So all of the expressions of, you know, the collective expressions of greed, of hatred, of, of craving of delusion, of confusion that manifest in our, in our world, in our communities, in our cities, in our families. And so it's uh, what feels like um, in this exploration that we're in, it feels more like a, a journey of uh, learning how to touch and taste and explore and and really know it through our body. So that's, that's why it becomes hard to sometimes talk about it because words are just concepts. But when we walk and in our bodies and try to understand like, what does it mean now? What does it mean now? Then we start to see all the forces that bring us closer to life. We get to feel into how complex it is and what a paradox we're living in. Right, this simple paradox of getting close to something that feels really painful in moments. Like that's a paradox in and of itself. Learning how to walk in our lives with intimacy is not easy. And so we're constantly shedding as we're doing this. The system that learns how to be vulnerable and exposed and then contracts with protection and feel into that. So letting go of any kind of resistance to what comes naturally for us. So we're even letting go of the resistance to the protective qualities that are here. Resistance to the resistance, if you will. So that's why using, learning how to connect and really embrace all of our skills and strategies is important. Because when there, there are moments when the pain of this, mo this, the pain in the heart feels unbearable or the uncertainty feels unbearable or when the heart just doesn't really know how to 
have the skill to connect. And we can see this in really simple ways when we sit down with the intention to meditate and the mind is all over the place thinking about all kinds of things. And we can watch those processes that are there, you know, the mind that gets really, you know, in, invested in a fantasy and then is more interested in playing that fantasy out than actually coming back to the breath, for example. So we can watch what happens when the mind is unattended, right? When, there's, when it's unattended and left to just kind of go off like that, that, that momentum is there and it gets established and builds and it perhaps becomes more and more challenging to bring the mind back to the breath, for example. So just one illustration of watching a process unfold as a part of our, 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 the process of studying, the work that it takes to be in our lives, on, our, on this path in a mindful, awake, intimate way. So letting go, letting go of trying not to be any particular way, letting go of trying to be better, letting go of somehow trying to achieve something. These are all ways of letting go. And we can feel into that, know what it's like to, to let go only while we're engaged. Otherwise, it's an intellectual exercise. Because any of us can read a description of the jhanas and understand it intellectually. And any of us can read what someone has said about samadhi, but to really live into a commitment to be here is a totally different thing. Right? So it's the equivalent of like really trying to understand samadhi by sitting on a rock at the river or while we're washing dishes or right in the middle of this totally imperfect and complicated relationship with a friend or a lover or a colleague or a, a teacher because we get to we get to see everything pop right there in that moment all of the activity of mind all of the ways that our heart is you know not quite free and learn how to relax right there with like, oh, this is life. So my commitment to steadiness includes a deep connection with life right here like this. Right here in all this ignorance. Right here with all this blame, with all this hatred, with all this rejection, with all this wanting. And it's such a blessing that we have each other. We have friendships and relationships and good Dharma friends and communities like this to come back to because it feels good in many ways to come back, hopefully at times, not always, because that's a reality too, but also because we're really challenged. We can be really challenged in relationship with each other. And if we're awake and practicing while we're in relationship, then we can start to see all the ways that we're not letting go. This, this heart is not letting go. And as I've said before, it's not to somehow, you know, this process is one of radical inclusion. It's like a big yes to everything, which means a yes to all of the protective strategies too. So the, you know, the ways that the heart shuts down or can't go there, doesn't want to be vulnerable, these are all just totally normal. And so we accept that as a part of our path, as a part of our practice. Last week I was, um, like I said, in retreat with my 
colleagues from the IMS teacher training program. We are well into our third year now on our way to year four and the completion of the program. And um, we had the good fortune to sit with Aya Ananda Bodhi, who is a bhikkhuni um, living in California. And she was teaching about the Terigata, which is a collection of the verses of the elder nuns, the fully awakened women at the time of the Buddha. And it was really impactful for me to sit with her and hear the stories of her, her own stories, but also to hear her communicate to us, tell us a lot of the history that is hard to find, right? The history of women at the time of the Buddha. And so I wanna read a little bit from the first free women, um, poems of the early Buddhist nuns. So she, uh, Maddie Weingast, who is the person who uh, wrote this new rendition of the Terigata, a collection of the verses of the elder nuns, uh, with, her, with her review. So she participated as he was writing these, um, rewriting these stories, really, these poems. Um, and I want to read a couple of them because of what I said earlier, that understanding samadhi, understanding the steadiness of mind, understanding this deep reverence and connection to life is really about tasting it, right? It's like really knowing what it's like in your body and your bones, deep in your heart. It's like what we've read in the chapter or are learning about is this often learning how to steady the heart. Um, a common way to do that is to connect with the breath and to invite the breath to suffuse throughout the whole body, right? So the body becomes really alive as the breath flows and nourishes. We start to feel, sense the body deeply. And this is a really good indication of how we relate to, how we can relate wisely to samadhi. I just to let it really sink into the heart, to let our experiences land and see what we can learn there, right in the middle of our lives with the geese and with the seasons that are changing and with the uncontrollable force of nature that is resulting in a hurricane right now and so much more. So I would invite you to listen to a couple of these poems. I'll read a few of them throughout the evening, but just to listen to him with that interest and in tasting, like what is it like as these fully awakened women describe their experience? And I'll start with some of the words from Venerable Ananda Bodhi, because they're so good. <laughs> She says, these poems you hold in your hands are like jewels to me. They call us to remember our greatest potential, our potential to be free. And ultimately, this is what samadhi is, this capacity to be free, to let go. While these academic translations of the Terigata may be literal, literally accurate, and with some effort, the inspiring teaching can be found, for me, they miss the quality of transmission and so remain as words spoken long ago, now dusty and dry. Reading through this new rendition, feeling the visceral response and experience, experiencing the sense of clarity and connection that came through, I realized that Maddie had taken these poems far beyond what I had hoped for. And then she says, living as a nun for the past 25 years, I have felt that I should present to the world what's good, what's inspiring, what's beautiful. In order to do that, I sometimes have to push away or put on the shelf parts that are not so beautiful and inspiring. I feel as though my spiritual practice has gone to a whole other level since becoming involved with these poems, both because of the joy they've given me 
and because they invite a wholeness that, that I had never quite allowed before. There are so many different kinds of women speaking here. Princesses and sex workers, young lovers and wives in arranged marriages, women who were quick to gain insight and women who had to struggle for years until one day it finally opened. Somehow, they all found the path. They all realized awakening. And so listening to the heart, which is what we're training to do, really listening to the heart and what it's speaking to us. Um, each of these poems are written with the author's name in the title. So this is called Dira, self, which means self-reliant. This is the name of the nun who wrote this. Look closely, my heart. See how all things arise and pass away. Even that which is turning the shapes on this page into the sounds and thoughts you are right now silently speaking to yourself. When you no longer need to read the signs to find your way, you'll know for yourself that books and maps can only get you so far. There is a direct path. Should I read that one more time? I'm gonna anyway. <laughs> Look closely, my heart. See how all things arise and pass away. Even that which is turning the shapes on this page into the sounds and thoughts you are right now silently speaking to yourself. When you no longer need to read the signs to find your way, you'll know for yourself that books and maps can only get you so far. There is a direct path. It's so beautiful, really pointing to how this path that we're on is, is about the taste. It's not about the concepts. It's not about the words. It's about finding our own way right? to really embracing all parts of who we are in that journey, to not having to reject anything, no identity, no bad attitude, no protective quality of the heart, no lack of concentration, no need to reject any of that. It all becomes our teacher. This is our path, right? This is all of it, you know, all of every, every bit of who we are becomes our teacher, becomes something to include in our journey. And this is called, I don't know how to say this, Sia, I think it's lioness. Does anybody in the room know how to say that word? That means lioness in Pali? Okay. People used to say that I was so beautiful that it hurt to look at me like the sun. The sun lights the whole world, but it isn't free. It lives its life on a leash. I lost weight and grew pale. My sister said I looked like a dead person. When I finally put on robes, my family was almost relieved. Maybe it would help. For seven years, I wandered. I got, I got really good at being sad. Late one afternoon, I took a rope and went to the woods. The sun was setting. I could feel the rough fibers against my neck as I put my head inside. That's when I saw it was just one more leash. What goes on? can come off. And once again, just illustrating with such beauty the, the power of being right with the way things are, not having to pretend at all, and walking the paths towards deeper understanding.
one of the points that Ajahn Suchito makes again and again is in his description of samadhi or this practice of studying is how important it is to learn how to be in our bodies because it's actually through the body that the body learns to discharge suffering where the mind tends to want to regurgitate it in the form of thoughts and stories when the body is able when we're able to connect with the body and feel the rush of anger in the chest or the tingling in the fingers or the heaviness of grief somehow the body that engagement with the body the life the energy the encouragement to flow with it to breathe with it to move with it supports its movement and again here is where this heart learns how to let go in community with the body I'm really curious to hear from you. You know, I've been talking a lot for many weeks. <laughs> and I'm curious how you're relating to this topic and how it feels to hear these words from me tonight. And I have lots more I could say, but I think I'd like to pause and just see what's here with us tonight. And an invitation to anybody who hasn't spoken yet to Unmute yourself and say something. Reflections, conflicts, places where you're finding it hard to be steady, places where you find the heart resisting the flow of life. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. Thanks, Femi. I thought I saw Tracy getting ready to speak. Is that true, Tracy, or no? Has, has the moment passed? No. Well, thank you. Just really helps us expand our definition of samadhi, moving away from or moving, including more of who we are and how we can understand and know what it feels like to be steady. I was having a, um, you know, like we all do have some challenging relationships in our family systems. I um, was having a conversation with someone who is a bit challenging for me and surprised at how easy this heart felt there and I like had a real easy time with caring and being compassionate and understanding and the call was over and there wasn't a lot of residue and i had a, like the, it was very curious about how this came to be so just about how this heart was feeling and so just kind of walked, you know, and did my life with a, a curiosity there. And I realized that there was some connection to ancestry in that moment. Some appreciation for this heart that had, like, I have a practice. And to some extent, I know how to practice. And I care about practicing. And I care about freedom. And in some ways, I'm doing what my elders, ancestors, family members haven't, 
been able to figure out. So in some ways, all the healing that takes place is in part for them. And then it also made it really clear how important it is to keep doing this for children, right? What are we teaching children? How, even if we don't have children of our own, we have some connection to somebody who has a child and we have some responsibility to leave this earth in a way that can be useful for the people who come after us. And so there is this interest in understanding like, oh, I wonder if this steadiness has some relationship to connection through time. And I'm wondering if this is what uh, people who have learned to the art of steadiness, like activists throughout time, or just human beings who wouldn't call themselves activists, who have learned to use their skills without burning out, with some resiliency for the good of others in real consistent ways, if this is somehow how they continue to do that. Right? And certainly this, is, this reflection has been influenced by this book that I'm reading called Breach of Peace. It's a, an illustration of all of the uh, freedom writers in 1961 who got on buses and rode routes cross country to uh, desegregate. And so they would, you know, ride from one place to another and get off at a, a segregated bus station and white and black people would then walk through the bus station and and more you know it wasn't just that but this as i was reading these stories of who these people were you know, pictures and biographies and a little bit of history of the movement i i was like oh they you know they had these looks on their faces just of steadiness they weren't excited like oh we're doing something good they didn't look scared they were just like yep this is what I'm doing. And I wondered about that. If they had some sense of this activity of body, right, being for the good of all. And if they even knew they were creating movement, but actually just doing the next right thing with this real embodied sense of history and planting seeds for the next generation, planting seeds of goodness, if they carried this with them as a way of expressing samadhi. And so perhaps this is one of the things that we can do is to get really curious about the component, like what, what is samadhi? How do we find that steadiness of like, what is this human being, this human heart, do? How does it move to find that steadiness? What are the resources? Perhaps it could be uh, this really, this deep and very visceral, simple knowing, like I'm doing this for my parents. I'm doing this for my grandparents who didn't have a, didn't have the opportunity that I do to practice. I'm doing this for children to have some impact to model something useful for them, to take care of earth and other humans in a way that communicates something about our deep connection to humanity. from listening to the heart. Or wait, did somebody unmute themselves? If so, I'd rather hear from you. Hey, Mary. 
So you mentioned earlier when you were um, I'm talking about what's a little bit far away, Mary. So I didn't hear all of. Can you repeat that one more time for me? Yeah. So. Yeah, so let me see if I can describe it a little bit differently. That we might say something like, we don't want to make a project out of this, right? Or say things like, this isn't about getting rid of something or somehow being good enough, or this isn't a self-help project that we're on. Meaning that we're not trying to rid ourselves of all of, you know, we're not trying to, we're not trying to get rid of something that's here. We're actually trying to transform our relationship to that. So that letting go is about, is about this heart knowing like I don't have to be better. Right? And in that practice of not having to be better, there's a connection and intimacy and acceptance of whatever this is. And it becomes included in this flow of life. It becomes in included in all of the processes all the deep connection to humanity becomes included. Even this bad attitude becomes included in, in the flow. Yeah, thumbs up. Awesome. And Stacy is typing in the chat here that, um, yeah, all of the, the, the Freedom Riders were trained in nonviolence and studied with Gandhi, which is, you know, even more clear that it's, that there is some uh, deep connection to com community there. And so it's important for us to remember this as we continue to practice, to remember that we're not just practicing for ourselves. It can sometimes feel like I have to do this thing. This is an individual, but it's really not an individual thing that we're doing. It is a connecting thing that we're doing. This one's called Conqueror. I was forever getting lost until one day the Buddha told me, to walk this path, you will need seven friends, mindfulness, curiosity, courage, joy, calm, stillness, and perspective. For many years, these friends and I have traveled together, sometimes wandering in circles, sometimes taking the long way around. There were days when I thought I couldn't go on. There were days when I thought I was finally beaten. It's scary to give all of yourself to just one thing. What if you don't make it? Oh, my heart, you don't have to go it alone. Train yourself to train just a little more gently. Anybody have a final comment, reflection to offer the room? Yes, I. Yes. Thanks for bringing us that. She has said is we have this banner in a room that used to be for our God kids, but now it's my partner's home office. Uh, but it says if we have, if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. Anybody else?
Well, okay. It's really good to be together. And uh, thanks for wandering with me on this exploration of form. It's been nice to talk a little and hear a little and talk a little and then hear a little. So I might experiment more with uh, hanging there and find some way to full rest of your week, everyone. Hopefully see you again.